is recording now. I forget. How do you how do you adjust this without breaking it? Screw this. Yes. Welcome to by way of reminder. This week, our episode is kind of a recap of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, hopefully, you've caught some of the other episodes where we've walked through our church covenant and kind of talked about what it means to be a member at Boulevard and, and more generally why church membership is important. Tonight uh, is a bit of a, of a recap, but uh, only, there is the, a last line to our uh, church covenant. And I'm going to ask somebody if they would be willing to read it. And you guys got it in front of you? Yeah, I can read it. Okay. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. So that is kind of a concluding paragraph, so that makes sense for us to kind of conclude, to recap the things that we've said. And so uh, it's going to be a little bit different tonight, a little bit of a different format in that I'm not the only one that's going to be asking questions. I've asked these other guys to, to think about maybe some of the things that, that we've, uh, they would like just to, to recap, to reemphasize, maybe some things that we could have spent more time on. Uh, so now is an opportunity to do that. So I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I'm going to get out of the way and allow you guys to, to interject some of the questions that, that uh, are on your mind. So... First thing I want to ask, and we're talking about church membership, it, it's always, I think, it's often raised the question, and it's always good to consider, does the Bible command church membership? If you're asking, does, is there a text that says, thou shalt be a member of the church, the answer is no. Uh, if you're asking if the concept is present, absolutely. Uh, the, the fact is, the early church, when you confessed faith in Christ, let's say spe specifically in the Jewish context, we know from the literature that oftentimes this led to the, the equivalent of an excommunication, of a, being kicked out not just of the synagogue, but disowned by family. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you'd find yourself uh, without your means of uh, providing for yourself or even a home. I say that to say they didn't have to have a formal membership per se. Once you had identified with Jesus, it was pretty much known you were part of that group. Uh, you can find Luke will use the term, uh, the phrase in Acts, followers of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing that stands out is nobody once wants to talk about church discipline, but in Matthew 18, when Jesus talks about church discipline, his, his process is you go to your brother, if they won't listen to him, take two or three with you, if they won't listen to them, tell it to the church, and if they'll not listen to the church, then you treat them as though they are not part of the church because of that lack of repentance. So there was some way of identifying those who are with us and mm -hmm. those who are not. Uh, I just think it's disingenuous of folks to argue, well, there's no formalized membership and there were no roles. That's a very surface and inadequate reading of the text. And, and I would even say there, it's peculiar to me how many times in the book of Acts it says, added to their number. Yes. Yeah. To what number? <clears throat> uh, over and over again, here thousands were added to their number. Um, Acts 4.32 says, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Yes. So there, there seems to be a, a communion, a some form of delineation between who's yes. with us and who's not with Precisely. us. Um, when, when Paul writes letters to these churches, there is a presumption that, that there is a, a group, a gathering, a, a, an entity, an organization uh, of some kind, and uh, it certainly doesn't, wasn't quite as institutionalized as many churches are now. Uh, but that's absolutely right, and and we even see that. I mean, I've been in West Africa and seen the that you didn't have to have a have signed a membership role, but in in some of these villages, when you profess faith in Christ and when you have been baptized, mm -hmm. you are ostracized from the entire tribe. Your way of living is at risk. Your family life and relationships are at risk, and uh, you have in some ways you have and depend on a new family. Absolutely. And that is your family in Christ. That Absolutely. is uh, the, the members of the body that, that Paul will talk about. Agreed. Yeah. You know, so like you said, there's not a 
necessarily a single command, but it's always assumed. I, I think, a matter of fact, I think Matt, when preaching recently, or I'm not sure what it was, but you'd said that, what do you call a, a Christian, a New Testament believer, that's not part of a church? And the answer is, is well, there's not one, because right. there's no such thing. Right. And, and so, um, uh, so it's, it's assumed everywhere. It's like saying, well, Trinity's not in the Bible. Well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but it's all over the Bible. Right. It's assumed. I mean, it, it's there. So, and to your point about adding, absolutely, in Acts, after when, when, when Peter's preaching this sermon at Pentecost, uh, and then you see he's, he basically tells them, you've crucified this Messiah, the God's Messiah. <laughs> and, and then these people are torn to the heart and they believe and, and they're, 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 they're baptized and then they're, um, they're added to the church. Mm -hmm. And verse 40 to 41, it says, and, and they were added, there were 3,000 souls added to the church that day. Then down again, verse 47, the Lord added to their number uh, day by day. So. Yes. It's also, it's God adding them to the church. So God is taking you out of this mm. and he's adding you to this. Yes. And this is the assumption. This, the, this is the ecclesia. It's the, it's the cult I want. This is the church. Right. Absolutely. And, and also, if you think from a, just a practical standpoint, I think in scripture you see this laid out mm. that, that there was a church. For example, you take shepherding and the role of an, uh, of an elder. How are they supposed to shepherd the flock if there's no church there to be shepherd, right? If there's nothing identifiable. If there's right. nothing identifiable with the church. And like, for example, in uh, Acts 20, verse 28, he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock mm -hmm. in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church, yes. which he obtained with his own blood. So not only, I mean, yes, us as elders, are, we're not supposed to, we are to care for unbelievers, but our primary focus is for those of a church and that is through membership so um it is woven and it is it is definitely implied in scripture yeah, yeah. So. agreed you guys have touched on a couple of what are some other shall we say wrong-headed notions about church membership <laughs> uh, i i think the one that i've encountered most often uh actually there's a couple of them. one is that membership in the church is automatically membership in the family of God. Uh, just having your name on a roll. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, years ago, whenever we were trying to do a better job of looking after the membership, and we were actually going through our church roll, we had 1,200 people listed as members of Boulevard Baptist Church. And we were seeing 200 maybe 220 any given Sunday. There's something desperately wrong with that picture. So as you, we went through the process of trying to say, are you with us or are you not? Can we reconcile? Are you going somewhere else? We would often get this pushback. Well, I don't ever intend to come back, but I, you know, I'm concerned. Why would you take me off the roll? Are we concerned for their soul? Or the other element of that was, well, I've always been a member of that church. It's a traditional thing. Uh, I've seen in some country churches that folks kept membership because they wanted to be buried in that church cemetery, and the only way you could be buried in that cemetery was to be a member of that church. <laughs> and we have actually had folks over the years that would, this is long ago, but they, they came to us, but they would never join us because their burial rights were more important to them than actual communicant membership in the congregation. <laughs> so those are a couple of the things that I've seen. Yeah. I mean, I would also say that the way that they view, at, like the way you view membership matters. So, for example, joining a church is not the same thing as joining the Y. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and that is why, like, we are having this discussion on the church covenant to show the importance and what, when you join a church, what that means. Yeah. And the importance, like, like a, a, when we covenant with one another, and Lance said this in, in one of our sessions that, that we had, you know, it's it's more co a covenant. That's why you call it a marital covenant because it's deeper than just an agreement mm. right. or, or a service contract, right? It, it, it is it is it is deeply deeply relational, yeah. and so and so I I would say one of the problems is is 
that when members don't view it that way, they just kind of view church merely transactional. Mm -hmm. Like I'm coming, you're supposed to t tell me about God and then I'm gonna get up and leave. No, mm -hmm. that's not what church membership it is yeah. about. It's about cur encouraging one another <coughs> to live for one another for the glory of God uh, um, yeah. and, and worshiping God together. So um, it, is, it is a deeply relational um, thing. And I think, I think the more that we understand that, the healthier our churches will be. So. Well, and, and, and to that too, Jason, that leading into what you're saying is this also this notion of, of people coming to church with this uh, more of a, a consumerism, uh, yeah. this idea of, of kind of a buffet mentality, you know, of, of what this church is going to offer me, what I can get out of this church, or, mm -hmm. or uh, well, it's got these good things for the kids, and it's got this, and it's got that. So you, you have this idea of people picking and choosing for what it is their desire. That's the completely wrong idea. And, and so <clears throat> uh, just, just another thought, you know, adding to, to what you're yeah. saying, but um, certainly yeah, I, I agree that you can, uh, this idea that the church membership comes with all of these privileges mm -hmm. and none of these responsibilities. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it is, it is a, a poor understanding of what it means to be part of a church. Mm -hmm. um, those are, those are good. Good answers. Thank you, guys. The, so being a member of a church, I think we would say, is the means by which uh, we distinguish ourselves mm -hmm. from the rest of the world as, as being part of a church, that we, we represent Christ to the world around us. We've mm -hmm. part of, you know, just as, you're, as you become a part of a church, uh, is it is uh, more, very often associated with, with baptism, Right, and the baptism mm -hmm. is making that public profession that I'm no longer living this way. I am now living uh, my life for Christ, as we represent Jesus in the baptism, and as the rest of our lives are called to represent Jesus. What happens when members don't represent Jesus well? <laughs> okay, well, um, well, there is a church discipline aspect when when that takes place. Like if someone does not. Uh, according to Matthew 18, if someone is has publicly sinned, they and you are to go to that brother and confront them. And um, if if they refuse to repent, repent, then it is um, brought before the leadership and the and ultimately the church um, for the good of their soul. In hoping that they would repent and come back, they would uh, be sent out, as Doug was saying, from us. Um, uh, because they are not of us if they refuse to repent of their sin. Um, but I also do think that um, if, if someone is, pro is a member of a church but living in sin and not repenting, they're, conf they're conveying kind of a false gospel to the world, a gospel that does not bring uh, one who was once dead to life. Um, you see this uh, very clear in the Apostle Paul in Romans, I think it's 5 or 6, where, where, where he said, like, hey, shall you, shall you go on sinning? By no means, right? By no means. We've been changed. We were once identified with Adam. Now we're identified with Christ. Um, also in 1 John, 1 John says in verses 6 through 10, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all the sin. If we say we, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So here in 1 John, we see this contrast. We are not to walk in darkness, right? Mm -hmm. We are to walk in light. But, but that is not perfection. That is seen through repentance. Right. So, 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 so the church, we are not saying you got to come to church and you got to be perfect. No, no, no. But if we are identifying with Christ, mm -hmm. our life is to be a repentant life in which we recognize our own sin and our need for a Savior and what Christ has done on our behalf. And, and we live that out it, through repentance. Mm -hmm. So. You know, there's, and I think sometimes we talk church discipline, which is an aspect of this. I think there's levels here that we have to keep in mind. Any of us can have a moment 
period where we have not represented Christ well. Mm -hmm. We've failed. Yeah. Any number of ways. And that's a personal discipleship issue that we just have to address as we walk with the Lord. Yeah. Um, what we're talking about here is not even a Christian sinning. And I appreciate the point you made, Jason. The issue is not the sin. The issue is the attitude about that sin once committed. Mm -hmm. yeah. If it is something where I'm in, contrary with, in a contrary position with a brother, and it's pointed out, this is your sin, and I'm willing to repent, that's a wonderful thing. The whole point is redemptive. Mm -hmm. You're wanting to restore them. It's not so we can get rid of people. Right. It is to restore them. Uh, if it is something that is so public, it has to be dealt with publicly. Same idea. Uh, it's not that the church should be aghast and embarrassed that a Christian has sinned. Right. I mean, I'm not saying we make peace with it or pretend it didn't happen, but we also shouldn't be so uh, stuck up about the whole thing of, well, how dare you, um, and make it impossible for a return. Uh, yeah. Discipline is a serious business, but the target inevitably is how do we get them back? Mm -hmm. yeah. How do we help a believer whom we're assuming is a believer because of what they've professed, mm -hmm. the covenant they've entered with the rest of us, how do we help them knowing the deceitfulness of sin, knowing the power of our own flesh? How do we help them back? Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, like you say, it's, it's the attitude about it, too. I mean, um, like you said, <laughs> we're, we're, we're a, a place full of people who sin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's going to happen. Uh, but it is uh, the attitude. I mean, b because um, it, it does, it can uh, weaken the church, I, it, 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 and, and, it, and it defames God in that sense, because we're talking about, I think Piper has a lot to say about this, about the glory of God. The glory of God is what is at stake. And I, and I think about the seriousness of, you know, when yeah. Paul uses the language about a little leaven leavening the whole lump mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and how that works. And, um, and I, I think of the imagery throughout Scripture about that about leaven or about sin. A while ago, I was thinking about uh, as you were talking. I was reminded of uh, Achan. Uh, you all remember mm, Achan, right. sin of Achan, and 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 the whole idea is, is is that they were told, "Don't do this. When you go and pillage, don't take these things from these people that represent sin and bring them back into my camp because that's not holy. That is not. That is basically he disobeyed, mm -hmm. and um, and he brought these things back, and we see this terrible consequence." Okay, from he and his family, and the whole the whole idea is is, is that God is holy, yeah. and and sin will not be in His presence. Okay, by the grace of God through Christ, we get to <laughs> mm -hmm. and represent Him in the church. But it's a serious matter, God's holiness, and so we need to take sin seriously. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that's exactly what you're saying is is it's not we're not going to sin. It's the attitude about it. If we're just doing it flippantly, and we're doing it loosely, and the world just sees that, well, how does that represent the church, and how does it represent God? So uh, that's kind of the idea. Well, and I, I think the, the, the other thing to keep in mind, if we convey somehow to the world that we think we've got it figured out, right. <laughs> that we think somehow we're better than they are, we have misrepresented the gospel right. and misrepresented ourselves. Yeah. It's not that we treat flippantly sin, but we also don't act as though somehow we've cornered the market on holiness. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the, the honest thing is I still mess up. I still sin. I still fail. And if I'm being serious as a disciple, I acknowledge that. I work through it in personal confession. If I've wounded somebody else, I seek to make it right with them. If I've dishonored the church, I'm willing to go to the church and say, I messed up here. And confession, repentance, is the path to forgiveness and yes. reconciliation. Yes. Yes. And so as long as we all understand we're in the same place, yeah. then it's not hard to receive people back when they've messed up. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. But there does come a point, and, and Jason, you alluded to this, when, when, when someone is is they've they've gone so far as to say i i don't think that what i'm doing is sin i don't have that that attitude i, I don't have the remorse the guilt the repentance that comes with knowing christ you know if if they're unrepentant then they're they're not in christ the bible talks about there are those who have gone out mm -hmm. from you that were never part of you mm -hmm. to begin with yeah um and we need to be clear to them that the path they're headed on 
would seem to suggest that they are not part of Christ, and it is, it is out of love for them and a desire to see them reconciled that we say, look, yeah. if you are in Christ, you must repent. Mm. If you are in Christ, you will mm. repent. And if you're not going to repent, then we cannot consider you a member That's right. of the body here. That's right. And that is graciousness towards that person. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that is actually love displayed towards that individual. And I think sometimes when we talk church discipline, that gets missed. Is, right. it, it is, is that we are caring, being faithful to Scripture for the good of his church and for the good of that person yes. in hopes that they return to the faith. It, either they come to faith, uh, either they were never part of the faith, or they re- later re- uh, repent and then return. That is our hope, and we're looking out for the best yes. for that person. Well, so. w- what more unloving thing can you do than let a person behave in a way that is indicative that they are not Christian yeah. and let them hold on to the name of Christian, the identity of a church member, and possibly end up dying and going to hell yeah. Because yeah. nobody had the courage to say, a Christian cannot behave this way. Uh, I'm re- Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 5, talking about an act of discipline in a grossly immoral situation, when you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan, that's the language used mm-hmm. here, for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Paul recognizes there's a benefit, a protection within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And for the church to say, you no longer evidence that to remove them from membership. If the church has done that faithfully in in the proper fashion, what you're doing is if they're a believer, you're saying, okay, we'll we'll let the enemy work you over for a little while Mm -hmm. in the hopes that that brings you to repentance. I think the corollary to that is if nothing happens it may well be indicative they never were the lords because there was no consequence for that happening so anyway important distinctions i think to make absolutely absolutely gary i think you had some things that you wanted to address bring up tonight some questions and things related to to membership as we've been talking Sure. Uh, just, I think some of these have been covered and some things we said, but just possible recap or just a, a reinforcement of what was said. Um, one of them was, um, and, and honestly, this first question was uh, personally uh, challenging and convicting for myself. <laughs> and so I, I, that's, that's what spurred this question. But uh, what challenges and hurdles or hurdles do we as individual church members typically have that prevent us from rejoicing with one another or bearing one another's burdens mm-hmm. uh, when, which we talked about that and mm-hmm. and so that would be the question go ahead so i would think and 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 i'm thinking personally here too even myself i think we do a, just as human beings a terrible job of setting priorities and time yes. management yes. And, and and putting putting God and his church as the top priority it should be. Um, You know, um, of course, our families are important, other things, but especially in the day and age in which we live, where we can be so easily consumed and we consume so much and be distractive. And we and I'm just thinking as a uh, father of kids, it seems like every night of the week, my kids have something to do. Right. And mm-hmm. it could be a school van, it could be extracurricular activities, whatever that is. And we make ourselves so busy mm-hmm. that we don't prioritize time to care for the flock yeah. and to care for our brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I would say that that is a conviction mm-hmm. um, yeah. that I even struggle with yep. and learning the best way on how to approach that. Well, obviously, that's a lot where I was going because that's one of the exact things I wrote down about myself. <laughs> and and I, I think of Ephesians 5 where it talks about redeeming the time because the days are evil. Mm-hmm. And, and so time is, is a, is a, it's a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a problem for me, and I recognize that. I mean, and, and um, because to bear one another's burdens and to rejoice with one another requires your time, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it requires effort. 
and it requires intent. And so when I, when I think about what Paul tells us to do, we get this imagery of um, a soldier. We get this imagery of an athlete. Uh, of all of these things, we are to be doing. I mean, in that, not in a sense like for our salvation, but in a sense for the kingdom and for the church. Um, um, there should be, there needs to be intent. When he tells us to love one another, mm. we know that, that that isn't a love that means feelings like you would love your wife. This is an, this is an action. This is loving one another by serving one another and, and by being involved in, in, in intentionally in one another's lives and rejoicing with them and, and bearing their burdens. And this requires an emptying of self. And, um, and, and so I think selfishness is, is a big issue. So Philippians 2 comes to mind, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, about consider others better than yourselves. And th- you talk about a crazy way of thinking nowadays. I mean, mm, that yeah. is crazy thinking. Consider yeah. others better than yourselves. That requires a lot of humility and, 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 a, and a lot of um, uh, effort to just yeah. beat yourself down in order to do those things. So, so um, yeah. I think, I think two, <clears throat> two things uh, that tend to work against that as well is, is one, our, our natural tendency is to see somebody that has a problem and go the other way. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, n- very few of us are running into burning buildings when other people are running yeah. out. Um, and yet, I'm not saying you ought to go run into a burning building necessarily, but we, we ought to be, as Christians, when we see, particularly our own brothers and sisters in Christ, when we see them struggling, mm-hmm. when we see them in pain or sorrow or suffering, our, our impulse, or at least our effort, it may not be our first impulse, but the thing that we, by, by God's grace, train ourselves, discipline ourselves to do is to move towards that person and not right. away from them. Yeah. The, and, and it's funny, that same impulse happens, I think, from those who are actually going through the sorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know that for me, oftentimes, if I'm going through a difficult time, my impulse is not to lean into my church family, but, mm-hmm. but to lean away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To isolate myself, yeah. and because I don't want to be vulnerable, I, I don't want to be seen as weak or in need or having mm-hmm. difficulty. I, I, I want to present that I've got everything together, and um, both of those things prevent us that uh, create hurdles and obstacles for the intimacy that we ought to be mm-hmm. um, yeah. enjoying. I agree. I, I think the selfishness shows up. I don't, We've mostly focused on the thing of bearing one another's burdens, the sorrow side of it. And you're right. I think there's a tendency both on the one who's struggling and those who see the struggle to step back from each other. Because it, it's like, I don't know whether I can deal with this. I don't know how that pain works. I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. There's any number of things. Or I just, I don't, I've got my own stuff, man. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't have yeah. time for this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even on the thing of rejoicing with one another, mm-hmm. sometimes selfishness shows up there. Well, why is Gary's life going so good and mine's going so rotten? Mm-hmm. No, yeah. There can be almost a jealousy or an enviousness yeah. set in where I can't rejoice with somebody else uh, because my, I feel like I'm being unfairly treated. The Lord's being nicer to one of his kids than he is to me, and I'm a little mad about it. Uh, selfishness shows up in all sorts of ways. That's all I would say yeah. to that. Great. Um, okay. Uh, second question. Uh, just a thought. Uh, are the commands from Mark sixteen fifteen and uh, Matthew twenty eight eighteen separate and distinct, or one in the same as it relates to the Great Commission? And if so, should there be a balance or an emphasis toward one or the other? So uh, the so uh, yep. the direction is go into the world and preach the gospel go into the world and make disciples. You mm-hmm. see what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. um, so just a question on that, and I hate to start by answering my own question, so I'll let you guys go. I, I, I think they are representing the same thing. Okay. Uh, Mark, Mark is writing to what we think was likely a Roman audience, and so it, he lacks many of the things that show up in either Matthew or Luke or certainly John. 
Uh, it's a much more fast-moving gospel. His favorite phrase repeated over and over and over and over again is, and immediately, and immediately this happened, and immediately that happened. So you get to the end of Mark, and the, his version of the Great Commission is a shorter version uh, with an emphasis on proclaiming the gospel to the whole creation. Matthew presents Jesus king of the Jews. And so the imagery here is uh, emphasis on authority. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, this kingship of Jesus imagery. And it's not that I think Mark took editorial privilege. They're both conveying what Jesus said mm -hmm. at its very core, what's going on here. Making disciples is in substance no different than preaching the gospel. And, and I, I can't remember who it was that said it. It was Robert Coleman or somebody else um, said, evangelism isn't done until you have disciples making disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. That the, the, the object of evangelism, now that doesn't mean that every time we proclaim the gospel that somebody will be converted. Lord willing, they will. But it doesn't always happen that way. But our goal is, is not merely to preach the gospel, have them make a, a decision for Christ, and then leave them in the dirt while we move on to the next person. Right. Right? We're, we're to, to bring them, not only to preach the gospel to them, but bring them into the church, bring them up in the faith, and then send them out mm -hmm. um, as, we, as we make disciples uh, Agreed. here locally and, and to the ends of the earth. Right. Yeah, and I, I would say just I, one, I would agree with Doug and Matt that it is talking about the same thing. Um, and But I would, uh, I would say how it relates to us, the Great Commission as the Church Covenant. One of the things that we do by joining Boulevard is that we are covenanting with one another that we will preach the gospel and take the gospel to the world, mm -hmm. not only here in Springfield, but we also support missions mm -hmm. um, across the world. And uh, it is something that I think our church should take some pride in, mm -hmm. it in like partnering with missionaries and stuff, mm -hmm. not, not, not for our own righteousness and, and patting, our, patting ourselves in the back. But I do think that like, that is something for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. a and and, uh, and which, which should, we should be joyful about. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but as it relates to the church covenant, mm -hmm. part of the us covenanting with one another is that we will do this together mm -hmm. and with one another going and taking mm -hmm. the gospel. So. Yeah, and so I think missions and evangelism kind of was under the umbrella of where, where that was coming from. And, and yeah, I agree. Um, I think the preaching of the gospel is, is the means by which you make disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, it says in Acts uh, 14, 21 says, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on to Barnabas and Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. So, um, so there's, there's this baptism. Um, and, and then there's the teaching to observe all things yeah. which I have commanded. And so um, uh, I think as it relates to missions, we're talking about church planting. I mean, we're talking, you know, there, that's, yeah. there, people have different ideas about what missions is. And, right. and I believe missions is more of, of, a, of, a, of a situation where there's church planting. Yeah. There's preaching of the gospel. And the, get, here's the idea. There's preaching and then there's teaching, right? When, one of these things. So there's, there's these ministries of, of preaching and teaching. Preaching, um, uh, uh, preaching the counsel of God, the whole counsel of God, um, uh, awakening the listener to the call of God and, and salvation and teaching is, is is training the mind and molding the mind and the heart and in, in, in the truth and and I I, um, I I think what we do here and I kind of had noted this accomplishes both because that's what expository preaching does yeah. is it accomplishes both things the gospel is woven throughout yes. what is preached and what is taught. It's amazing what people will hear that will bring conversion at times. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't even a sermon. They just heard something that wasn't even what it sounded like gospel related and they were converted. Mm -hmm. And so, but it, but it's, it's, it's our, and I, I think it was, is you that teaches us when we're in, in preaching is what is it? The GCF? Is that the gospel center? Oh, focus? a fallen condition oh, focus is where you start. Fallen condition focus. Always bring it back. Absolutely, Relate yeah. the text to the gospel. That's where mm -hmm. I was going. Mm -hmm. And right. so, uh, so with that, so anyway, so, um, 
that was kind of the idea behind where I was going by. Okay. That. So anyway, um, and lastly, another question would be, uh, when and what are legitimate times and reasons to leave a church body to join another? And what role, if any, does either church have in the process and why? I know that could go deep. But, but, uh, <laughs> There's a few sermons. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, the things that leap to mind for me is certainly if you move. Yeah. Uh, holding a membership in a church that you cannot attend because yep. of distance is not in anybody's best interest. Yeah, right. That's why the covenant includes in it, if we remove from this place, mm -hmm. we will, as quickly as we can, yeah. find another church. Uh, because it's not about us, it's about the kingdom. Yeah. So we want you to find some place. Yeah. And we hope you do that within a year. And if not within a year, we try to pay attention. If we've not heard from you, we're going to say, okay, we know you're there, do you need help? Yes. We'll help you find a place. Um, I think a, a second legitimate reason would be that there's a ministry opportunity there that you have a gift that could fulfill that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and to me, that would be one of those, the churches would have to, in essence, both smile on that. Say, we as the church where they're a member now agree. They have this gift and we're sorry to lose them. But if what they have can benefit there and you mm -hmm. have a place that that'll work, we're not gonna interfere with somebody's call. Yeah. Uh, if we see that in, in that sort of way. Um, I think if a church departs from the faith, then you not only uh, have a legitimate, you have a compelling <laughs> reason to get away. The um, abandonment of sound doctrine or, right. or, yeah. or, or the gospel as it is. Exactly. Right. And, and that list could be even a little bigger than that. Maybe there's some things that are going on that are extraordinarily unhealthy. And we don't have time to go into all the elements sure. of that. Um, and I, I would say this, if in conscience you reach a place where you can no longer in good conscience be a part of that church because of a shift in your understanding and doctrine, or they've shifted, and it may not even be a primary issue, right. but it's an issue that's big enough that it's disturbing sure. to you. Baptism and is baptism. one. Right. Eschatology sometimes is one. Yeah. And if, if it's such a big deal that you're always troubled, then that may be a, a message to say, okay, I'm not saying this is a good church or a bad church. We've just reached a place where I don't want to be divisive, and this issue matters more to me than them or vice versa. Uh, the issue matters more to the church than it is to me personally. I probably should be somewhere else. But that, I think that last one needs to be really examined closely yeah. before you make those kinds of decisions. Yeah, prayerfully thought through, uh, prayerfully, um, you know, praying over it. At what In situations like that, when you're dealing with a conscience issue, I, I find it wise, and I've spoken to, um, I've had brothers um, from other churches that have dealt with this before. And really, they, the, the way I've seen it handled in a right way is when you encounter those type of situations is, one, they're in prayer about it. Mm -hmm. And then, two, they also seek some godly wisdom from, yeah. fr from mm -hmm. fellow brothers and advice on the situation. Right. And then if they still cannot see themselves staying, then, then at that point they, they, they leave. Right. And I often tell folks when I do membership interviews, I say, look, if you reach the place somewhere along the way that you just, it, it, it doesn't fit, you got to, there's a conch, you know, this kind of an issue, come and talk to us. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact is, I'll, we, I say I, we will even help you yeah. find another church mm -hmm. that may be closer to what it is you're looking for, a sound evangelical church. I mean, if now if you've if you've given up on the gospel, um, <laughs> I'm not going to recommend you to another church because you're a heretic. Uh, <laughs> you may not know Jesus, and and we may advise against them joining a particular church yeah, because we uh, know precisely. that particular may not even in our mind call it a church, but that particular body is has themselves we abandoned don't, exactly. the gospel. Yeah. We don't see that healthy, and we would say so. So, m matter Doug, what what role then? Does the receiving church, the church where someone is going, what role do they play in receiving a person coming from another church? I think that, yeah, 
<laughs> Ideally, um, I think the receiving church ought to know what the issue is. Ought to have enough gumption about them to say, okay, we know this church. Why are you feeling compelled to leave from that church? And what's your relationship to that church now? If I contact the leadership of that church and ask them, say it's Gary, and, and you know, if I call Boulevard and say, tell, us, tell me about Gary, what are they going to say to me? Uh, those are important questions, I think. You want to do this as much as possible sure. in such a way that you're not creating burdensome things for folks. Right. And, and I don't want to give people a pass for stuff that is, to me, it's a small potatoes issue or somebody's got their nose out of joint about something. This ought to be, and of course this requires personal accountability. Mm -hmm. How are you going to respond to this? If, if you're upset because we changed the color of the carpet and every Sunday it just bugs you because the carpet's blue and you knew green was the right color, you know, I'm going to do the Christian thing and say, grow up, <laughs> get over it. That's not, if that's a conscience issue, you and I have remarkably different understandings of conscience. <laughs> anyway, I think there's an obligation in both directions. Both churches. Yeah, I, I would agree. Okay. On to yours. You're up, El Pastor. El Pastor. All right. Uh, I know this one comes up. I hear this occasionally. Why do we pray as much as we do in our <laughs> worship services? I've heard this in, in different, from different folks, visitors and even members at times. Well, I mean, if you think about who we are there to honor, God then it only seems reasonable that we would talk to the man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I say man, not, not some flippant man upstairs kind of thing, but <laughs> we're, we, we're, we've come to worship God. Mm -hmm. um, and part of worship includes prayer, um, both prayers of, of praise, of thanksgiving, of confession, of repentance, uh, all of these things. It, it's because um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's about him. Uh, we're commanded to pray without ceasing, um, it seems only appropriate that we would model that in the gathered <laughs> service. Okay. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would, I would agree. Well, one, we're commanded to pray, <laughs> so, so that's it. Seems like a pretty good reason to do it because mm -hmm. um, uh, we want to be obedient. And um, two, that is like Matt was saying. That is how we commune with our Father, right? We. Uh, um, we see God as, and what Scripture teaches, He is our. He's not only our Lord, um, but He's also our Father. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, we petition mm -hmm. Him, we ask Him, we we seek forgiveness from Him, we seek His grace and His mercy upon us in our lives, and we do that through prayer. Okay. Yeah, He He first and foremost is our audience, and. Yeah. We, we, it's important to understand that we worship and serve a living and an intimate Savior mm -hmm. and God. Mm -hmm. And like you talked about recently in your sermon, our Father. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, and, and it expresses, I wrote a few things down here, but it expresses gratitude to, to Him. It yeah. expresses faith and trust and reliance upon Him, uh, that, that, that we, are, we have a need for him and yes. and um, it places the focus on him, like you were saying, Matt. Um, um, uh, expresses love for for him when we pray for others. It expresses love for them. Yeah. Uh, c corporately, I mean, and uh, and it's encouraging uh, for in, for that reason. So um, there's there's lots of reasons, but he's the central focus. All right, I'll I'll do the, a corollary, a follow up to that. In our services, one of the things we've done the last few years, having moved toward elder leadership is we've included an elder prayer as part of the worship service. And I, 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 I meant to look back. I'm not sure how long we've done this now. It's been over a year, mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking. Um, but that prayer tends to be a longer prayer <laughs> than the prayer of, of invocation after the call to worship yes. or the prayer after the responsive reading 
or when we were taking up an offering, the prayer that we do at that time, we're no longer doing offerings, but there's at least two places for prayer there. We have a benedictory prayer at the end of the service. Almost inevitably, those of us who preach have a brief prayer at the beginning and even ending of the sermon. So we've got, what's that, five, give or take. And then we have this one, right before the sermon, an elder prayer. So. If you want to explain to people why we do that and why it tends to be a longer prayer, what would you say? Go ahead, Gary. Well, let oh, you start. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons, but but first, it is. I think you talked about this recently. It is us gathering corporately together uh, w w when someone is praying and you're praying with and on behalf of everyone present before God. Um, uh, it, it, like I said, it, it expresses a, a reliance on him. It's, it teaches us how to pray. These prayers are really instructional because they teach you about who God is, and they teach you about the nature of who he is. Um, they teach you about what he has done, uh, what our relationship with, is with him, um, uh, and, 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 and how, we, how we are reliant completely upon him. And so um, uh, it, it portrays reason and purpose for, for, for our meeting. Um, he is, uh, we need to remember that, that, that we are not there the, for our own entertainment or our own desires or purposes. Mm -hmm. we're, we're there for him. And, and, and it's not about what we desire. It's about what he desires. So we, we are lifting up to him, first of all, um, uh, worship and, 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 and uh, honor and glory to who he is. And then we, we petition. We have multiple kinds of prayers. There's, there's thanksgiving. There's intercession. There's praise. Um, and what am I, there's the fourth confession. one. Uh, in confession. And so... Um, uh, these are four, and probably one of you guys could probably touch more on why we pray those four, but those are the four prayers that are prayed. Um, uh, and so those are some reasons, but I, I, I think that we need to remember what we're doing here. Yeah. Okay. What, what's the point of what it is that we're here doing? And remember who it is that we're praying to and, and who the audience is. Uh, anyway, that's... Yeah. I, I'm not, oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, okay. I would also say... It also displays, I think, the length of the prayer. I'm not saying it matters a whole, whole lot. Um, I don't want to, like, over-spiritualize it. Like, hey, hey, you know, we, pr we pray these long prayers. But I think one thing that it does is um, it allows us to see our need for God. Yes. Because what it does is we have much to confess. <laughs> okay? <laughs> we have much to praise the Lord about. We have much to, to be, be thank thankful for, <laughs> and we have much to ask him to be yes. gracious to us uh, about. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so it, I think one of the reasons why it's long is I think that we as, as eldership it, and, um, is, is we, we want to recognize the need, and, and, and we want the church to recognize, and our, even our own hearts, to recognize our need for him yes. in, in a great, great way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I would add to those. I appreciated what you mm -hmm. guys just said. Um, there, when we come to gather to worship, there, while I, I agree wholeheartedly that the object of our worship is God, there is a, a secondary purpose. I mean, all of us could worship, could theoretically worship God by ourselves, right? Uh, and the, it, it stands to reason that I could perhaps study my Bible more closely if I were locked in a closet than if I were to do so in the midst of 200 people. It, it, it stands to reason that I might have more focused or intense prayers by myself than I would in a gathered. So it, it seems like there's something going on when we gather mm -hmm. that has a, a horizontal um, uh, discipleship focus. Mm. That while the, the primary, as, as the Sermon on the Mount would say, our primary purpose when we pray is not what we're saying before men to, to exalt ourselves, there, there is a sense in which um, as we are praying together, as we are singing together, as we are reading scripture together, there is, there is a teaching element that goes on. The, mm -hmm. the, main, the main discipleship method of the early church 
was the worship service, was, mm-hmm. was the gathering. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so if we're going to, to teach people how to pray, they, it seems stands to reason that people, if, if prayer is important, it's to be done often and, and frequently, and at, um, there, there is something, I think, to be said about disciplining ourselves to, to praying longer than we're accustomed to or comfortable with. Um, and so it seems like that, that maybe part of uh, what we can help folks do is, is help them learn to, to um, stretch their attention and their focus yeah. level to, yeah. to, to see not only – and I don't want to over-spiritualize and yeah. say that an eight-minute prayer is better than a seven-minute prayer. That's, that's not my point. But if, if we are to engage in prayer, and, and it, there are times where lengthy prayers are appropriate in our own personal life – a good way to see that modeled is during the worship service. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I would, you know, I will admit there are times that I catch my mind wandering during prayer. And for me, it's part of the discipline, like it'd be the discipline of hearing a sermon. Uh, you know, some people say, well, preacher, say it in less time. You, you took 40 minutes. You could have said that in 20. Sure. That's, there's a certain element of truth to that. But there's also this thing of, okay, so what God says doesn't deserve any more of our attention than 20 minutes. Uh, I'm not saying that 40 is holy or 45 or the same thing. Uh, but, you know, I'm usually the one coming up to preach right after the elder led prayer. And I know that I'll catch myself thinking about, okay, here's what I start with in my introduction. Here are my points. Did I remember that text? And then it's like, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> Praying. What Gary, Matt, Jason, Gail, whoever, doing, engage. It's learning. And the primary purpose is not the length. It is certainly not to show off how much we know. It is not that God will hear us because of our many words. It is seeking to do a better job of reflecting the breadth and the depth of the prayers you even see in the text of Scripture. While there are prayers that are very short in Scripture, there are others that are chapters long. There are others that are an entire psalm that is very lengthy, that has a repetition in it. It was probably uh, hymnody more. But, you know, there's one where a statement is made, his mercy endures forever. A statement is made, his mercy endures forever. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Well, why are they doing that? It is an aspect of worship. It's a way of expressing it. And I think as elders, we just kind of have to be sensitive to a couple of things. One is, I know that I advise guys who go to new churches that aren't accustomed, young pastor going to a church that has never had expository preaching. Say, okay, you're going to go to expository preaching. Yes, I am. What are you going to do? I'm going to do the Gospel of John. It's going to take us 10 years, and I'm going to go an hour at a time. And I smile and say, no, son, you're not going to do that. Don't do that. Pick a shorter book take bigger bites, and aim for 30 minutes. Until they get used to that kind of preaching, you've got to work a little bit to help in discipling them to follow that. Mm -hmm. I said the day will come when you can likely do it a little longer and go deeper. But even D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the master of expository preaching, if you look at his early sermons, covered much larger sections of Scripture than he did toward the end of his ministry. Part of that was the doctor's knowledge grew. Part of that as well was he had taught a congregation how to listen to that kind of preaching, and I'd say the same thing is true in prayer. I I would say you could tell a lot about a church by their prayer, by their content, by their their understanding of God and and, and how they they pray. Yes. um, That's true. Very good. Okay. Um, we've run out of time. In fact, we've gone over our, yes. our typical amount of time. No benediction. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, I wanted to, to, to say to the folks that are watching, um, our plan is to do for the the week that follows this. Uh, we're going to try to do a live stream, and we're going to be addressing any questions that you have. Over the last few weeks, there have been some questions that have been submitted. Uh, that were uh, either they weren't germane to the topic at hand. They were great questions. 
we just couldn't get to them in time, or they were germane to the topic, and again, we just ran out of time. So we're going to be addressing some of those questions. If you have questions, um, they can be about church membership, they can be about biblical theology, um, they can be about uh, questions that you're facing in, in doing evangelism. Uh, we're just going to open the, the floodgates. If you've got a question uh, and, and you'll, you're willing to submit it to us ahead of time, that would be ideal. Those will receive first priority. <laughs> uh, but we're also going to monitor the stream, and so as you're watching, uh, you bring up a question. If we have time and we can fit it in, we'll address that as well. Uh, but we, we hope that these, uh, these discussions on church membership have been fruitful and helpful to you as, you and, and as we all help better understand uh, the importance of part, being a vital part, a, a member of the body of Christ, particularly as a member of Boulevard Baptist Church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.